Good evening, everybody, or good evening uh, from Eastern Australia, if that's where you are at the moment. My name is Stavros Paspalos, and I'm the director of the Australian Archaeological Institute at Athens. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's public lecture. And it is a particular pleasure to welcome and to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Estelle Strastens. Before I do so, I'll ask everybody to make sure that um, they've muted themselves. I'd also let you know that um, the lecture will be recorded and will be posted on our YouTube um, channel. Um, there will be opportunities, an opportunity to ask questions at the end of uh, the lecture, um, and I'll ask you to do so by typing them into the chat facility and I'll read them out um, to our speaker at the end. Dr. Strasdens, I am pleased to say, has a long-standing relationship with our institute. She was our Athens Fellow in 2009-2010 and then shared that position again in 2018. She completed her Bachelor and Master degrees at the University of Melbourne before moving on to Oxford, where she was awarded to doctorate in 2013 for a thesis which examined Greek literary works written under Roman rule. The monograph which developed from her thesis is shortly to be published by Oxford University Press under the title of Fashioning the Future in Roman Greece, Memory, Monuments, Texts. And I know that it is eagerly awaited. Estelle has published numerous papers in research journals and other academic collective works and more are forthcoming. Her established position in the academic world is also evidenced by the many research fellowships, academic awards and honors she has received. She has lectured at various universities and for various other educational and research institutions. And from 2020, she holds a lectureship at the universe, a lectureship in ancient history at the University of Queensland for um, when she speaks to us this evening. Estelle's primary, though not sole, research interest focuses on the literature and wider cultural history of Greece during the Roman period, especially the way in which the past was viewed and represented. I believe that she will take us on a journey examining such matters in her lecture this evening. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn the session over to her so she can present her lecture, The Remembering Marathon. Estelle. Thank you very much, Stavros. So um, the first thing, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk as well. It's, um, it's really great to have that opportunity. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is share my screen. Oh, where have you gone? There you go. So that you can see my lovely PowerPoint. Um, and second thing I want to do is to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live the Yugara and Turrbal people. I acknowledge the grounds of this university were always places of learning and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I work on lands which were stolen and acknowledge the sovereignty was never ceded. Um, so yes, so thank you very much for inviting me and today I really want to explore how the cultural notions surrounding the Battle of Marathon have repeatedly shaped responses to its physical remains within the landscape, um, focusing especially on some early Western European travellers to Greece and the Soros or Tomb of the Athenians. And I think there's really no better place to start when the, than with this particular um, lithograph produced by a Frenchman during the Greek War of Independence. Um, and what you can see here is the ghost of Miltiades, the Athenian general, um, appearing to a Turkish soldier. Um, and what he's doing is pointedly reminding the soldier of the Battle of Marathon and foretelling the victory of the Greeks in the present conflict in the War of Independence. So this image here is really tapping into the symbolism of the Battle of Marathon. Um, and the idea of these greatly outnumbered free Greek forces expelling a horde of Easterners trying to make them slaves and thus preserving the origins of everything Western Europeans at the time held dear about their own culture. The significance of the battle was, of course, identified and shaped by the Athenians pretty much immediately, and it became a um, defining event for Athenian identity. Um, 
blah, blah, blah. Sorry. So this um, poem here that I've got up on the slide um, is by the six, the late sixth, um, early fifth century poet and philosopher Xenophanes of Colophon. And it really taps into the cultural impact of the, that the Persian Wars had on the Greeks. So it wants you to imagine that you're um, sitting by your fire when you hear a knock at the door. And he says, in winter, on your soft couch by the fire, full of food, drinking sweet wine and cracking nuts, this is how you should address the chance stranger at your door. What is your name, my good friend? Where do you live? How many years can you number? How old were you when the Persians came? So the poet here is assuming the Persian Wars is an event that everyone can relate to. Like where were you when man landed on the moon or when JFK was shot or when Princess Diana died, those kind of things. These pivotal moments that affect everyone in some way and really unite a culture. So something so momentous that everyone knows where they were when it happened or can relate to it in some way. This cultural potency of Marathon drew early Western European travellers to that famous plain once they started coming to Greece in significant numbers from the mid 17th century onwards. And today I'm going to focus on their interaction with the Soros or Tomb of the Athenians as they sought concrete signs of the long past battle on which to hang these cultural longings. So these early travellers possessed classical educations and they had come to know Greece first and foremost through its literature. The Hellenic spirit was really perceived in the poems of Homer, in the histories of Herodotus, Thucydides and Xenophon, the philosophy of Plato and the tragedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, among many other authors of particularly classical times. Post-classical texts like Pausanias's description of Greece and Strabo's geography, on the other hand, although they weren't really valued as literature, had concurrently worked on European imaginations to shape their preconceptions and expectations of Greece's physicality, as well as the continuity of its traditions. These pre-existing conceptions of Greece, drawn from the pages of books, were therefore well-developed and firmly set. Consequently, early travellers expected to find a land impregnated by the classical past. That's what they went to find. The early 19th century Irish antiquarian traveller and artist Edward Doggall's attitude in this is typical. And you can see that in this passage from his classical and topographical tour through Greece published in 1819. That's about experiencing Athens in physical reality, but augmented by cultural imagination. So he says, walking over the ashes of demigods and heroes and in treading the same ground that they have trod before, the force of association contributes to revive their identity in the mind and to transfer it to the surrounding objects. They live in the imagination. Their presence is breathed over the hills and rocks. It haunts the dells and the groves and animates every part of the panoramic view. The whole locality is consecrated by the memory of statesmen and warriors, of historians and poets, of critics and philosophers, sages and legislators, of whom not only Athens, but the world may be proud. So you can really see here this strong investment in the idea that the landscape is haunted by the classical past and that the ruins of the past are acting almost as time machines that can connect the modern European with the ancient Athenian. So this is the attitude these traveller scholars brought as they tried to delineate the classical layers of Greece within the modern Greek landscape. Um, before we look at some of the travellers' responses to Marathon, I'll have a, I thought we should have a quick review of the famous battle itself via Herodotus' um, already retrospective description. So Herodotus is obviously writing after the battle and he, um, he describes it in sort of familiar cultural terms. So initially um, we have Hippias, the son of the tyrant Pisistratus, directing the Persians to land at Marathon. The Athenian forces are then led out to meet them by 10 generals um, and they send a messenger to Sparta. Um, Sparta is celebrating the Carnea festival and say that they can't come until after um, the festival is complete after the full moon. Um, Athens is joined by a force from Plataea and then the Athenians debate about whether they should fight or not um, and the vote as to whether to fight or not is tied. 
And at this point, Miltiades steps in and urges Callimachus, the polemarch, who has the deciding vote to vote to fight. And he does it in these kind of familiar cultural terms. So he says, Callimachus, it's now in your hands to enslave Athens or make her free and thereby leave behind for all posterity a memorial such as not even Harmodius and Aristogeton left. Now the Athenians have come to their greatest danger since they first came into being. And if we surrender, it's clear what we will suffer. But if the city prevails, it will take first place among Hellenic cities. Okay, so um, Callimachus then votes to fight. The battle is engaged. The Athenians attack on the run. The center fails, but the wings are successful in a pincer type movement. The Persians uh, retreat and are routed in the marsh. We're told by Herodotus that 6,400 Persians are killed, but only 192 Athenians die. The Persians flee, Greece is saved, and then the Spartans turn up. Um, the Spartans, when they arrive, are really eager to see the battlefield itself because they want to see all these dead Persian, Persians. So they actually perform the, um, the role of being the first tourists to the, the battlefield of Marathon. This map here comes from um, James George Fraser's great commentary of Pausanias' description of Greece from 1898. Um, and what you can see here is the plain of Marathon where the battle took place. Um, you can see the great marsh where the Persians were routed and so many of them um, came to a bad end. Um, and very prominently, you can see the Soros or the tomb of the Athenians marked. This is just to give you an idea of the, um, of the space of Marathon and what it looked like at least, or how it was, um, how Fraser has show, showed it in his late 19th century commentary. So Marathon, due to all its cultural connotations, was a favorite destination for Western European travelers. The journey from Athens, however, was not always easy or necessarily safe. Um, in 1776, the Englishman Richard Chandler published his travels in Greece, which detailed a trip made some 10 years prior at the behest of the Society of Dilettanti. Um, Chandler, one of his kind of defining attributes in his text is that he's always very concerned for his own safety and comfort. So he's always worried about where danger may come from and where his next bed is going to be and what quality it will be, what it might take. Um, so his um, defining sort of response initially to Marathon is a concern about wolves. So he says, the region abounds in wolves, several large and fierce dogs guarded us and at intervals barked vehemently and ran together in a troop, as it were to an attack or to repel some wild beast from a charge. So Chandler, initially not that excited about Marathon and a bit worried. Um, Dodwell, who we saw just, who we met a little bit earlier, has quite a different experience on his arrival in Marathon. So he says, Marathon is one of the prettiest spots in Attica and is enriched with many kinds of fruit trees, particularly walnuts, figs, pomegranates, pears and cherries. On our arrival, the fine country girls with attractive looks and smiling faces brought us baskets of fruit. Some of them appeared unwilling to accept our money in return, and the spontaneous civility and good humour of the inhabitants soon convinced us that we are in Attica, where they are more courteous to strangers than in other parts of Greece. Um, I'm not entirely certain that this is something that persists to the present day, that Attica contains the most courteous of people in Greece, but maybe you have different experiences of that. Things, however, could get quite serious as well. So in 1870, an uh, expedition by a group of English and Italians, um, including Lord and Lady Mooncaster and a child, left Athens to visit Marathon. They were unfortunately, though, captured by brigands on the way and um, were being held to be ransomed for £32,000. Um, someone had to go back to Athens to, kind of, to help raise this money and lots were drawn to carry a message. A young Englishman in the party wins, but he defers to, um, to Lord Mooncaster, who is then sent off to Athens. 
Um, and during no negotiations to try and raise this, uh, this ransom, the Greek authorities, in defiance of a promise made to the English, decide instead to attack the brigands, and this move ends in the death of all the hostages. Um, so it's unfortunate for this young Englishman who decided to swap with the, with the Lord that this happened, um, So because he ends up dead. And this incident um, almost leads to war between um, England and and Greece at the time. Eventually though, the brigands are caught and they're brought to Athens for trial. Um, and this image here shows you um, an, an image that was in the um, Illustrated News of London in, on June 11th in 1870. And it's titled, The Greek Brigands Brought, brought Prisoners to Athens. So it was big news in England. And this is from a roughly the same time as well, a drawing of the plain of Marathon with the Sauros or the tomb of the Athenians in it, and the title, Scene of the Recent Greek Massacre at Marathon. So going to Marathon was not necessarily just a, a lovely day trip. It could get you into trouble as well. Should the traveller actually make it to Marathon unscathed, um, it was Pausanias's second century AD description of Greece that served as his, as his guide. So nothing really like Pausanias's description of Greece survives from antiquity, and no topographical account has been so influential on the exploration and study of Greece in the modern era. Pausanias came to mainland Greece from Asia Minor, and his project was selective, interpretive, and instructive. And he was really aiming to give um, his informed understanding of the cultural landscape of Greece as it appeared to him in the second century AD. In Pausanias' text, it's Greece itself, its history, its ruins, its arts, it, and its rituals that really star. And as well as engaging in a sort of art historical analysis of the artifacts that he encounters, and by that I mean that he classifies statues, for example, by artist posed material. So um, really trying to get at the, the makeup of these artifacts. He uses them primarily as touchstones for cultural history and religious practice. So he interprets what he sees in the landscape on the page for future readers and constructs a version of, or his version really, of a textualized museum of Hellenism. The selectivity and adjudication that he applies to the meeting of Greece's past and present is an early paradigm of classical reception that profoundly affected subsequent efforts. His careful expositions of the artifacts, spaces, rituals and landscapes of Greece made him an invaluable resource to those Europeans who came to explore its antiquities in the modern era. And partly the reliance on Pausanias comes from the failure or the perceived failure by these European travellers of local Greeks to explain the landscape in classical terms, so in the terms that they are really looking for and their failure to show European travellers what they really wanted to see, which was the classical landscape rather than the modern landscape. And again, Dodwell can provide us with a representative view here. So he tells us, a traveller must not expect to derive any information whatever from the generality of Greeks upon the antiquities of their country, but must extricate himself as well as he can from the dark maze of conjecture and uncertainty by the topographical light of Pausanias and by the few scattered materials of some other authors. So what does Pausanias say about Marathon? He says, there is a dean called Marathon, equally distant from Athens and Charistus in Euboea. It was at this point in Attica that the foreigners landed, were defeated in battle, and lost some of their vessels as they were putting off from the land. On the plain is the grave of the Athenians, and upon it are stelae, or pillars, giving the names of the dead according to their tribes. And there is another grave for the Boeotian Plataeans and for the slaves, for slaves fought them for the first time by the side of their masters. Here is also a separate monument to one man, Miltiades, the son of Cimon, although his end came later. At Marathon every night, you can hear horses neighing and men fighting. No one who has expressly set himself to behold this vision has ever got any good from it, but the spirits are not wroth with those who in ignorance chance to be spectators. The Marathonians worship both those who died in the fighting, calling them heroes, and secondly, Marathon, from whom the parish derives its name. 
and then Heracles saying that they were the first among the Greeks to acknowledge him as a god. A trophy too of white marble has been erected, although the Athenians assert that they buried the Persians because in every case the divine law applies that a corpse should be laid under the earth, yet I could find no grave. There was neither mound nor other trace to be seen as the dead were carried to a trench and thrown in any which way. So Pausanias really outlines the monumental landscape of Marathon, focusing first on the, on the Soros. So the Soros is really the most important thing, the tomb of the Athenians. Um, he then talks about the um, separate monument to Miltiades, and then finally about the trophy that was set up at the point where the Persians turned and ran. So this is the, the kind of Marathon that the travellers were expecting when they get there. Chandler, in his Travels in Asia Minor in Greece, which um, describes a trip made roughly a decade earlier at the behest of the Society of the Dilettanti, um, talks about the Plain of Marathon. And he says that it is now, it, and this again is the, um, the map of Fraser. So he says that it is long and narrow, um, opposite, as you can see, opposite the range of mountains, so the mountains here, um, by which the village stands up here, um, is the sea over here. Penteli, the mountain, um, with a lake at the extremity, as I noted from one of the summits, is at the southern boundary. At the other end, there's also a ridge, the isthmus of a considerable promontory once named Kynosura, or the dog's tail. This is beyond a marsh or lake um, from which a stream issued, the water at the head fit for cattle, but salt near the mouth and full of sea fish. Many aquatic birds are flying about. The soil is reputed exceedingly fertile. We rode through some very thick corn of most luxuriant growth, and the barley of this track um, was anciently named a Calayan, perhaps for its tallness. So even the, um, even the crops are being interpreted through the classical past. He continues by directly engaging the landscape through the text of Pausanias, saying, Many centuries have elapsed since the age of Pausanias, but the principal barrow, it is likely that of the gallant Athenians, still towers above the level of the plain. It is of light, fine earth and has a bush or two growing on it. I enjoyed a pleasing and satisfactory view from the summit and looked, but in vain, for the pillars on which the names were recorded, lamenting that such memorials should ever be removed. At a small distance northwards is a square basement of white marble, perhaps part of the trophy. A Greek church has stood near it, and some stones and rubbish disposed so as to form an open place of worship remain. The other barrows mentioned by Pausanias here, it is probable, are among those extant near Brauron. And when he says Brauron here, he really means Rana. So this is um, the mound that has been identified as the tomb of the Plataeans at Vrana near the, um, the Archaeological Museum of Marathon. Um, and this here is a, another drawing from 1835, which is from sort of roughly where Vrana is looking across the plain of Marathon, where again, you can see the Soros in the distance. So one of the things that Chandler misses are these pillars or stelae with the names of the gallant dead that Pausanias describes. Um, so Pausanias tells us that there were these, these pillars giving the names of the dead according to their tribes. And this is one of the things that um, Chandler is not very happy about, not being able to find. Now, the reason for their absence seems to have been solved in 2000 when a casualty list for the Eric Theus tribe was discovered at the private villa of Herodes Atticus, an Athenian magnate and Roman citizen of the second century AD. Um, so Herodes was this obscenely wealthy benefactor um, who gave both or updated the Panathenaic Stadium in, in Athens and um, built the Odeon that's built on the south slope of the Acropolis. Um, he was a very prominent uh, Athenian at the time. He tutored the emperors Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Ferris. He came from the Dean of Marathon and he importantly traced his descent back to Miltiades and Cymon. Um, he also owned much of the land around Marathon. And this might be um, why he felt that he could take these um, 
these memorials to the Battle of Marian, Marathon, to his private villa that was actually in the Peloponnese about 200 kilometres from Marathon itself. So just to, this is a bust of Herodes Atticus that's now in the National Museum in Athens. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of the distance. So Marathon over here in Attica, and he seems to have transferred these memorials. There were probably 10 of these pillars um, for each of the tribes and the names of the dead to a villa at Luku Evakinuria. Um, the stele itself is really quite interesting. Um, one of the interesting things about it is the, the list of names, which you can see, these are the, the 22 names of the dead. Um, you see they're arranged in this kind of offset way. Um, and this seems to be designed to invoke both um, monumental um, buildings, so that sort of isodomic um, uh, stone masonry. Um, but also the arrangement of the hoplite phalanx that destroyed the Persians. So it's not just an inscription really, it's this sort of artistically inscribed narrative of glorious death. And as well as having our tribal heading up here, it also has this commemorative epigram. Um, and the epigram says, I declare whoever dwells beneath dawn at the ends of the earth will learn of the arete, the excellence, the virtue or the valour of these men and how they died fighting the Medes and how they crowned Athens, having taken on the war a few against many. One of the really interesting things about this um, epigram is that, um, as um, Andrei Petrovich has, has argued, is the first word, fermi, um, kind of both invokes the I declare with the stone speaking to the passerby trying to get their attention, but is also the vocative um, of the the word for, for oracular utterance. So the kind of the use, the version of the noun that you would use if you were talking directly to the um, oracle. Um, and so he says that this is potentially addressing a specific oracle and you might wonder which oracle. And the key seems to be in the phrase ends of the earth or eschatogaias. Um, and we find in Herodotus in book seven, the um, oracle given by the Pythia at Delphi where she tells the Athenians before the Battle of Salamis that they should flee Athens and flee to the ends of the earth because the Persians are coming and they're going to destroy everything. Um, so he sees in this uh, speaking back to the oracle saying, well, we didn't flee and we won. Um, and this tells us that this, this inscription was set up both after Salamis, so not directly after Marathon, um, but also that it is, you know, really, stressing the, the choice of the Athenians to fight against the Persians. And it gives us this really nice tie in between the literary and the material evidence for the battle. So both, you know, I declare and also, hey, Oracle, listen to me. So then you might be wondering why does Herodes schlep the monument for Marathon to the Peloponnese, given that he owns most of the land around, around Marathon anyway. Um, and this is really another story, but in brief, um, Herodes uses this casualty list to signal his inheritance of this Marathon tradition. So elsewhere, for example, he's, he's epigraphically called the hero of Marathon. So it's this real identity that he fosters. Um, and he places it in a decorative arrangement in this villa that includes depictions of members of his family, of prominent Roman era Greek elites, of copies of classical ideal sculpture, and busts of Roman emperors, these types of things. So it seems he's trying to create a kind of anthology of Hellenic heroic virtue in which to situate his own family, most of whom predeceased him. But as I said, that's really another story. And the important thing to note here is that Herodes, like Pausanias, recognised the cultural capital in the Battle of Marathon and um, how it can be exploited. So back to the travellers. So when Dogol comes in 1806, um, he tries to verify pa Pausanias by going beyond Chandler with a bit of amateur archaeology. Um, but he also notes the tradition of travel and explication that has sort of preceded him. So he says, you know, that there's no real point in describing um, the plain of Marathon because it's been described by both ancient and modern authors. Um, 
And so he says instead that he's going to confine himself to a few necessary observations of the memorable spot. So what does he observe? So he tells us that the plane, which is about five miles in length um, and two in breadth, is at present composed of corn and pasture land. The countrymen were reaping the corn and a great quantity of cattle were feeding in the uncultivated parts. A large tumulus of earth rises in the middle of the plain and nearer the sea, close to a marsh, are two others composed of small stones and much lower than the former. Pausanias mentions two sepulchres in the, in the plain, that of the Athenians and that of the Boeotians and slaves, beside the monument of Multiades. The same author conjectures that the Persians were buried in a pit because he says he saw no tumulus or monument erected over their remains. The great tumulus has been opened, but without success, because it was not excavated to a sufficient depth. It is singular that no ancient armour has ever been found in the plain of Marathon, nor scarcely any relics of the many thousands who perished in this memorable field. Time may bring to light some interesting particulars, and a proper examination of the tumuli would be productive of objects of interest to the antiquarian and historian. I found in the large tumulus some fragments of coarse pottery and a great many small arrowheads of black flint, which probably belonged to the Persian army. Um, so Dodwell suggests he rifles around in the tumulus a bit and he's not the first to do so. So as we can see again from this 19th century um, drawing of the tumulus, that a day out at Marathon involves not just walking around, but also having a little bit of a dig to see what you can come up with. So these chaps have clearly found an amphora over here. So it's what you do when you go to Marathon, so you have a rustle around looking for remains. Um, some of the excavations that predate Dogwell's efforts include um, that by the French consul in Athens, Favelle, in 1788, who undertook an eight day excavation, but found nothing of interest. He did, however, leave a big hole in the tumulus that many other travellers comment on. Um, Edward Clark, an Englishman in 1801, he was critical of Favelle because he thought that he hadn't dug deep enough. So he thought that if you were going to find anything in this tumulus, you would have to dig below the level of the plain. He also, like Dodwell, found these flint arrowheads. Then a year later, you get Lord and Lady Eldon in 1802, and they were specifically looking for weapons, but they didn't find any. And then Dodwell is there around 1806. So if we take a closer look at Dodwell, um, following his excavations, he theorises about the arrowheads that he found. Um, and this here shows you a drawing of some of the, some of the things that he found in Attica. Um, and these, the ones circled here are the, is how he depicts the um, flint arrowheads. So he tells us that he found, that he found um, in the tumulus his coarse pottery and a lot of these small arrowheads of black flint, which probably belonged to the Persian army. According to the testimony of Herodotus, he says, the Ethiopians who formed part of the army of Xerxes in Greece had darts, the heads of which instead of iron were of pointed stone. Um, so what he's, when he, what he's referring to here when he says um, that Herodotus mentions the Ethiopians is this passage here of, from Herodotus book seven that talks of the Ethiopians who came with Xerxes. So it says that they were wrapped in skins of leopards and lions and carried bows made of palm wood strips no less than four cubits long and short arrows pointed not with iron but with a sharpened stone that they used to carve seals. Furthermore, they had spears pointed with a gazelle's horn sharpened like a lance and also studded clubs. So importantly, Herodotus here is talking about Xerxes' invasion of 480 to 479, not the Battle of Marathon, but Dodwell's desire to make a solid artifactual connection with, um, between Marathon and, and the tumulus there um, overrides this small detail for him anyway. Dogwell then uses this deduction about Ethiopians to correct and expand on Pausanias' description. And he does this through the cult statue of Nemesis at Ramnus, which is a sanctuary not far from Marathon and associated by Pausanias with the famous battle. Um, so Pausanias tells us that 
the punishment of the goddess Nemesis, that specially implacable goddess to wicked and violent men, fell on the barbarians who landed at Marathon. They were so sure that nothing could stop them from taking Athens that they carried a block of Parian marble to fashion into a trophy for their deeds. Phidias worked this block into a statue of Nemesis. Okay, so he tells us that the cult statue of Nemesis was crafted from a block brought by the Persians. Um, he tells us that Phidias crafted it, but the um, base was actually signed by Agoracritus, who was a student of Phidias. Um, by Pausanias's day, Nemesis is really inseparable from the battle because of this connection made. Um, and because of this, um, because of the understanding of Nemesis' role in this battle, there was a mistaken tradition in Pausanias' day that the sanctuary was founded after the battle. We know that's not the case because there are votives that date from the early 6th century and there are at least, and there were two temples that were, um, that existed before the, the temple built after the Persian War. So Pausanias, as well as telling us that this um, statue was crafted from this block built by the Persians, also describes the statue. And he says, on the head of the goddess is a crown with deer and small images of victory. In her left hand, she holds an apple branch. In her right hand, a cup, a fiali here, on which are wrought Ethiopians. As to the Ethiopians, I could hazard no guess myself, nor could I accept the statement of those who are, who are convinced that the Ethiopians have been carved upon the cup because of the river Ocean. For the Ethiopians, they say, dwell near it, and Ocean is the father of Nemesis. So this is um, his expert, he, the connection of Ethiopians here to the, the cup, that, um, the ritual cup that, that Nemesis is holding. So Dogwell uses the artefacts that he found in the Soros to revise, clarify, and extend Pausanias's narrative. Um, so he says that according to the testimony of Herodotus, the Ethiopians who formed part of the army of Xerxes in Greece had darts, the heads of which, instead of iron, were of pointed stone. Ethiopians were represented on the cup which was in the right hand of the statue of Nemesis at Ramnus. Pausanias is at a loss to account for the representation of the Ethiopians on the cup, but the reason seems ever sufficiently evident. So Dogwell is explaining that there are Ethiopians on the cup because they fought at Marathon, although Herodotus only says that they are in Xerxes' armies for the second invasion. But Dodwell can say that they are at Marathon because of the solid evidence of the flint arrowheads that he found in Soros. So you can see how he's writing, um, he's explaining the, the history through his own explication of both the physical artefacts and the textual evidence of Pausanias. So he tells us also, he goes on to say, it's the only part of Greece where he found arrowheads of flint, um, that there are really, it's really common to find bronze ones in places where battles have been fought, um, that they're generally not above an inch in length. And you also find these sort of almonds of lead um, in the plain and in different parts of Attica. And they're generally not larger than the fruit with the shell on. They were used by slingers and are sometimes inscribed. That which is published here was found at Athens. Its inscription may be a proper name, so Cleonicus, um, or perhaps a composite epithet signifying illustrious in victory. Another is double the usual size. On one side is inscribed Dexai, receive it, and on the other, a thunderbolt in relief. So Dougall here is creating a whole story based on his amateur archeology span and his reading of the landscape through Pausanias' text. Dougall's interpretation of the flint arrowheads, um, that they belonged to the Persian force, briefly led to the idea that the Saurus was the burial place of the Persians. Um, Colonel William Martin Leake, however, in his 1841 publication, sees them as offerings to the Marathon of Makoi or those who fought at Marathon. So Colonel Leake travelled and surveyed Greece in the first decade of the 19th century, publishing his Topography of Athens in 1821. The second volume, The Deme of Attica, sees Leake visit Marathon and approach the landscape with Pausanias in mind, but probably also in hand. In general, Leake based his method on Pausanias first and foremost, but supplemented that text with all other literary references available and compared those to what he found on the ground, as well as utilising coins, inscriptions, maps, 
and the narratives of travellers who had gone before him. About the Soros and the Ethiopian flints, he notes. So the tumulus is known by the name of Soro, the tomb, the word which has probably been applied to it by the people of Attica ever since its erection. It's about 30 feet high and 200 yards in circumference, composed of a light mould mixed with sand, amidst which I found many brazen heads of arrows, about an inch in length of a trilateral form and pierced at the top with a round hole for the reception of the shaft. There were also in still greater number fragments of black flint, rudely shaped by art, and which in general are longer than the arrowheads of brass. All these were probably discharged by the Persian bowmen, and having been collected after the action, were thrown into the grave of the Athenians as an offering to the victorious dead, who thus received the first marks of those heroic honours which were ever afterwards paid to them by the Marathonians. He does note in his second edition that maybe these flints are natural formations because they're find, found in many other sites in Attica. But in the initial publication, he thinks that they are the collected um, arrowheads of the Ethiopians that have been offered to the Marathon of Mekoi um, in their interment in the Soros. So it became really common for travellers to come to Marathon looking for traces of the battle. And there was also quite a lot of demand for Marathon memorabilia. And all of this led to a lot of unofficial excavations in the Soros, to the point that it began to resemble something of an erupted volcano with a deep crater at the top. So this is an image drawn around 1850. You can see how it's slowly being dismantled. And of course, all of this looking for concrete signs was happening of the Battle of Marathon. Um, was happening against the background of the Greek War of Independence, which you know, concluded in 1832. So this war for Greek freedom powerfully informs the desire of Western Europeans to find concrete evidence for the burial place of the Athenians. And this brings me back to this image, which is not only tapping into the connection of Marathon with Greek freedom, but also with Pausanias's depiction of the plain as haunted. So Miltiades here, the ghost of Miltiades, is possibly one of Pausanias' ghosts, ghosts who fight every night at Marathon. The connection of Marathon with Greek freedom, both in 490 BC and in the Greek War of Independence, was solidified shortly after the conclusion of the war, when on the 12th of May in 1836, the Greek Minister of Education, who was responsible for cultural affairs, sent a decree to the Provincial Directorate of Attica, prohibiting further unauthorised excavation of the Soros because of its cultural significance, as he said, the most, um, the most ancient monument of Greek glory. Despite this official attempt to crystallise the Marathon legend in the tomb of the Athenians, in the Soros, exploration continued. Um, George Finlay, for example, in 1838, was the first to identify the mixed layering of the Soros and suggest that the so-called Ethiopian arrowheads were in fact much older and are regularly found in Attica in areas unrelated to the Persian invasion, but not at places like Thermopylae or Plataea, where you might expect them if they were associated with the Persian army. So Finlay decided that the mound was prehistoric um, and there has been some verification for this view in the 20th century um, through archaeological work, which reinterprets the um, flint arrowheads as fragments of obsidian flake from the Neolithic or Bronze Age. The idea of the mound being prehistoric, again, raised questions as to whether the Soros could be the tomb of the Athenians. And it's important to note here that this changing view is really based on an evolving understanding of the artefacts that are being found in the plain. An official excavation by Heinrich Schliemann in 1884 um, decided also that the mound was, um, was prehistoric, so it was a cenotaph of the 9th century BC. And he based this really on the sort of the meagre finds that he discovered, comparing the mounds to those at Troy, because he saw really strong relations between them, and largely on the reinterpretation of these arrowheads as being prehistoric and not associated with Xerxes Ethiopians. 
then a later official excav excavation by Valerius Stace in 1889 to, to 1891 um, did what um, Edward Clark had suggested should be done already in 1801, and that was to dig below the level of the plain. So he actually dug 13 feet below the level of the plain, and he found two brick offering trenches um, inside the Soros, covered by a layer of ash with charred bird, charred bird and animal bones, and also um, some human remains. Um, and this is really a common feature of a lot of aristocratic funerals in um, early 6th century BC Attica. There are also 34 pots found, mostly black figure, of the 6th century BC to the 5th century. So the dating varies wi widely from between 570 to 490 BCE. Um, this sort of thing is also common in archaic aristocratic Athenian burials. Um, but it has been interpreted as sole evidence that this is the burial mound of the 192 Athenians. So it's um, interpreted as these, the earlier vessels are seen as being um, offerings to, a being, a be, as being kind of sort of valuable heirlooms of um, the mourners who have deposited them in the tomb. So if, it, if the vessel comes from the sixth century, it doesn't matter, is, is the argument. So the Soros really seems to have had this quite complicated history, maybe beginning life as a prehistoric mound, maybe used for archaic and early classical burials, um, and you know, indeed maybe for the Marathon of Makoi. And there's also some evidence of late Roman graves near the top. This complicated history, however, pales in the face of the overwhelming cultural desire to give a definitive sign of the famous battle of 490 BC and its glorious dead. This cultural desire is really summed up nicely by Colonel Leake when he says of the Soros, this heap of earth covers the remains of the 192 heroes who purchased with their lives a victory, the most remarkable for the disproportion of the parties engaged that history has recorded. A victory which may be said to have affected the arts policy and civilization of Europe from that time to the present. Um, and of course, it's also reflected in the Greek Minister of Education in 1836, um, referring to the Soros as the most ancient monument of Greek glory. So despite the piecemeal and not entirely conclusive excavational work on the Soros, its identity as the tomb of the Athenians has never been in doubt. Confirmed already in the second century AD by Pausanias, who was looking for concrete signs of his own Greek culture in the Roman present, um, confirmed then by early Western European travellers who concurred by interpreting the landscape they found through Pausanias' lens, and then by official excavations that have added further weight by highlighting the exceptional nature of the, the fighters at Marathon, the Marathon at Makoi. Um, and this is you know, something that was already pointed out by Thucydides, who tells us that they were singled out to be buried on the field of battle rather than in the public cemetery of Athens, like all the other war did. So that features of the Soros resemble earlier archaic aristocratic burials um, are really uh, interpreted as signs that the dead of Marathon were buried in a special way. They were buried as heroes. One of the most remarkable aspects of this process and the thing that I am most interested in about it um, is the human need here for concrete signs by which to connect more meaningfully with the past and to funnel our emotional investment in it which of course is the function of any war memorial or tomb. So the Soros at Marathon is really just an aggrandized version of this. So a monument that funnels the cultural longings of anyone who identifies with or finds value in Greece, her legends, culture, and legacy. Okay, and that's, that's the end. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and just wanted to stress that that's the, the thing that I find really amazing about it, this is the desire to attach, to, to find um, the past through material signs of it and um, the importance of, 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 of finding the truth of these signs in a way. So thank you very much. Stop my share. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, um, Estelle, for that that fascinating presentation which which married together so well uh, 
the ancients and uh, the more modern travelers and which showed how education, selective memory, landscape, or form a great nexus which allow threads to be um, w w uh, woven um, from uh, an individual's time and space, time uh, through uh, back to um, different times and different spaces. And particularly for um, the way you show that the early travelers um, uh, contributed so much in, to the, uh, the creation uh, and development of archaeology and how they, they, they played up to their audiences. Um, and uh, so, um, at least it appeared to me, uh, was, was so concerned to bring something new um, to, their, to their accounts, um, which uh, also um, uh, played well uh, to their knowledge um, of, of the classics and what command they had of them. Um, I'll remind people that uh, Estelle uh, is more than happy to take questions. 